summer, 1941. The eyes of the Western world are on Europe. German armies had overrun much of the continent. President Roosevelt signed the Lend-Lease Act to aid Britain, which stood alone against Hitler's ambitions. The Western allies paid little attention to events in Asia. Desperate for natural resources, especially coal and oil, Japan invaded Manchuria in 1931. Its occupation gradually spread into greater China until 1937, when a skirmish at Beijing ignited a full-scale war. Imperial Japan's well-trained and well-equipped armies and air forces swept aside the Chinese defenders to occupy all of China's ports and major cities. The nationalist Chinese government, under Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, retreated to Yunnan province in far western China. In 1939, Japan invaded Indochina for its rich deposits of coal and oil. If China fell, all of Asia and the Western Pacific might fall to the Japanese sword. That year, Madame Chiang Kai-shek hired Claire Chenault, a fighter pilot recently retired from the U.S. Army Air Corps, to train and lead China's struggling and outdated air forces. In Washington, war with Japan was looking increasingly likely. President Roosevelt gave Chenault permission to recruit 100 U.S. Army and Navy fighter pilots, along with ground crews, to fight for China as the American Volunteer Group, or AVG. Under provisions of the Lend-Lease Act, Chenault was given 100 P-40 Tomahawk fighter planes just rolling off the Curtis Wright assembly lines. Living and working at primitive jungle airstrips, enduring shortages of planes, pilots, and supplies, and fighting against a vastly superior enemy, the AVG Flying Tigers would give the Japanese a series of staggering blows that would tip the balance in the war in China. I'm Gary Sinise, and this is Missions That Changed the War. The first American volunteer group of the Chinese Air Force was officially created on 1 August 1941 by order of Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek. Pilots and ground staff began arriving in Burma from the States in early August by ship to Rangoon, then on the narrow-gauge Burma Railway to Kaidaw Field at Tonggu, 175 miles north of Rangoon. What the newcomers found at Kaidaw Field didn't please them. They griped about the tropical heat, the torrential rain, the millions of bugs, the primitive bamboo huts, the uncomfortable cots, and the British supplied cigarettes and food. AVG chaplain Paul Frillman feared a mutiny. It was a real harsh environment. Tungu, the Brits wouldn't even be there. They'd move out of there in the uh, summertime. Butch Carney, who had been with Chenault in Yunnan, China, appointed three squadron leaders. Robert Sandy Sandell, a former Army flight instructor, got first squadron. Second squadron went to Jack Newkirk, a Navy fighter pilot from the carrier Yorktown. Arvid Olsen, a veteran P-40 pilot, got third squadron. Each squadron leader chose 12 pilots. Newkirk chose mostly Navy flyers. Olsen picked only Army pilots. With more pilots filtering in through August and September, Chenault began the task of turning them into an effective fighting unit. He established what came to be called Chenault's Kindergarten. Daily classes on geography, jungle survival, and most importantly, on tactics. Training curricula would be 
60 hours of lecture, tactical lectures, and 60 hours of familiarization in the P-40. And of course, the Navy guys, we'd flown nothing but round engines, so, you know, it was a challenge on the checkout from those. Forget everything the Army Air Corps has taught you about fighting, Chenault told the men. Instead, they were to adopt the battle-proven tactics used by the RAF in Britain. That meant two plane formations against fighters for maneuverability and mutual protection, and a three-plane flight for firepower against bombers. The Japanese planes turn much faster than our tomahawks, he told them. Never get into a turning fight with the Japanese. Hit their formations from above, out of the sun, to scatter and confuse them. Then pick them off one by one, he told them. These were the tactics the Japanese would try to use against the Americans, as described in a captured Japanese training manual. Japanese pilots, he told the men, were well-trained and disciplined. They knew how to fly, and they knew how to shoot. But they could be beaten by hit-and-run diving attacks. One of the characteristic things of all the leaders of all the Air Forces of the world, for the most part, was that they're wrong about almost everything they did. But you had a few people, like Claire Chenault and a few others, who had a journeyman's view of the problem. They, they looked at it not from some abstract uh, Julio Doué point of view, but from the standpoint of, uh, I've got a tool in my hand, how do I use it? And if you were as an experienced fighter pilot, as, as Claire Chenault was, uh, you knew exactly what climb and dive tactics would produce, you knew what turning tactics would produce, and you knew what the airplane in, in your uh, inventory would produce. So he looked at the P-40 and uh, he knew it was not a dogfighter and he tailored his tactics to it and, and it served beautifully. He obviously knew a hell of a lot about the Japanese uh, <clears throat> tactics because after observing them in these tactical lectures, he was able to uh, impart the things to us that made, actually, is, is what really made us, were the tactics that he taught us. You see, the uh, people down in the Pacific, they had, they had the same airplanes we had, but they lost practically all of them. And the reason they did is because they did not use the tactics that Snow taught us. And those tactics were sent back to the War Department, but they never disseminated to the guys down in the Pacific. But they were very simple, and I guess they thought they were so simple that they, were, they didn't mean anything. Back in the States, some of the recruits had been told that they would mostly be shooting down unarmed Japanese transports. Some of them signed on with the AVG because they thought that fighting the Japanese would be safer than fighting the Germans. Two of the pilots were killed in training accidents in September. At the end of the month, seven pilots and a crew chief quit and sailed for home. Tex Hill, Eddie Rector, and 15 other pilots reached Tonggu on September 15th and were assigned to squadrons the following day. Navy pilots Hill and Rector went to the second squadron. First time I met Chanel, I could never have been more impressed. I mean, the features on that guy, if you've ever seen pictures of Chanel, uh, is a, he's a craggy wrinkle and those black eyes, which come from somewhere, they must have some Indian blood in them somewhere back down there. Way. I know he's from French Huguenot background, but anyhow, uh, he's the kind of guy that immediately uh, instills confidence in you. I, I know that I was impressed by uh, if he told me to go through that wall, I'd, I'd go. Um, he was a great guy. He, he, he was very loyal to the people that worked for him. Uh, he had a lot of people above him that didn't like him because he made them look like Ned and the third reader.
More pilots arrived in October. Worried about a possible air attack on Kaidaw Field from nearby Thailand, Chenault sent his three squadron leaders on a recon flight. Thailand was officially neutral, but it had almost certainly been penetrated by the Japanese. The three pilots scouted as far east as Chiang Mai, but saw no signs of the enemy. We had no nav aids. Everything was dead rusting. The maps we had originally were French maps, and any relation between that map and the terrain would be a coincidence. And the first maps that we got that were any good were the first Japs we shot down. Then the Japs had pretty good maps. And later on in 1943, of course, they mapped our, our, our country mapped the area and got very good maps in. On 26 October, an unidentified aircraft flew over Kai Dal at 6,000 feet. And the next day, a group of six aircraft scouted the field from high altitude. AVG pilots scrambled, but their tomahawks could not climb fast enough to catch the intruders. Chenault believed they were Japanese planes flying from Thailand. In fact, they were Mitsubishi Ki-15s flown from Hanoi, Vietnam, 600 miles to the east, sent by the Japanese Army Air Force to photograph airfields in Burma. Designed as a fast civilian mail plane, the Mitsubishi Ki-15 Wild Goose served the Imperial Japanese Army and Navy as a light attack bomber and reconnaissance aircraft. It was amazingly fast for an airplane with a fixed landing gear, with a top speed of 298 miles per hour. The Allies codenamed it Babs. November 3rd would be remembered as Circus Day at Kaidaw. Two tomahawks ran off the end of the runway, one of them a total loss. Two pilots taxied their planes into parked aircraft. Another pilot hit the brakes and stood his P-40 on its nose, while two hapless mechanics sat on its wings. Seven planes damaged in one day. Two days later, Ed Conant, a veteran Navy flying boat pilot with little time in land planes, cracked up another P-40, his third in a week. Two more, the mechanics said, would make Conant a Japanese ace. Chenault sent an angry letter to his stateside recruiters, demanding that they weed out the timid and incompetent. 26 more pilots arrived in mid-November, among them a feisty, hard-drinking marine fighter pilot named Greg Boyington. It was just uh, real primitive. But our guys had guessed to that, you know. We, the environment we were in, our guys were very resourceful. And Chenault didn't put a lot of restrictions on us. He just told us to let us use what ingenuity we could we had and uh, go out and kill as many Japs as we could. A few days after they arrived, one of the new pilots was flipping through a magazine and saw a photo of a British P-40 with a shark's mouth painted on its nose. He showed it to his squadron mates and they asked Chenault for permission to adopt it as their squadron marking. Chenault said it should be the group's emblem. Within a week, every tomahawk on the field had a shark's face. It looked, said one pilot, mean as hell. Squadron emblems also appeared. The first squadron chose a green apple and a uniformed Adam chased by a naked Eve, symbolizing the first pursuit, nickname Adam and Eve's. Second squadron's planes sported a black and white panda the symbol of China, and 3rd Squadron, Hell's Angels, chose a bright red nude with wings and a halo. Every plane also carried the insignia of the Chinese Air Force, a white, 12-pointed star. The last group of AVG personnel, four pilots and nine flight instructors, reached Burma on November 25th. The pilots went to Kaidaw. The instructors were sent to Yunnan, China to train Chinese Air Force pilots. November also brought promises of greater support for the AVG. 
More planes, more spares, more supplies, more pilots and ground crews. In Washington and London, everyone who mattered now understood that the war with Japan was coming. The British offered Chenault a squadron of Brewster Buffalo fighters from Singapore, along with their pilots and ground crews. And there were promises of British and American bombers. The Brewster Buffalo was the U.S. Navy's first monoplane fighter. Introduced in 1939, it never lived up to its promises. By early 1941, the Buffalo was already considered obsolete, outperformed by the new Grumman F4F Wildcat and by most Japanese and German fighters. By the first week of December 1941, the American Volunteer Group had 60 combat-ready P-40s at Kaidaw Field. Three more pilots quit, leaving 82 pilots on the AVG roster in Burma. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Without warning, Japanese forces attacked Pearl Harbor, Hong Kong, Malaya, and Wake Island. From his headquarters in Kunming, Chenault immediately put the AVG on a war footing. He assigned the third squadron, Olson's Hell's Angels as the assault squadron, armed, fueled, and on alert. Two days later, an alert at 3.30 a.m. sent four P-40s into the air. It was a false alarm. Landing in the dark, Tex Hill overshot the runway. His mates found him standing dazed near his wrecked tomahawk, with an unlit cigarette in one hand and an unlit match in the other his clothing soaked in gasoline. We were, it was true that we were mercenaries, but, uh, but then when the Japanese hit Pearl Harbor, then we were involved, our country was involved in the war. And uh, what brought us together is that it uh, was necessity, you know. It was, a, it, it, it was teamwork. We had a uh, hardcore that had flown together. We didn't have people rotating through us. We're all in the same boat over there for this year. The British asked Chenault for a squadron to help protect Rangoon's harbor and its airport at Ming Aladan both staging points for supplying British forces in Singapore. On Thursday, December 12th, the 18 Tomahawks of the 3rd Squadron, the Hells Angels, left Kai Da and flew to Ming Aladan. Their ground crews, support staff, and three more pilots traveled by truck or train to Rangoon. In mid-December, Brigadier General John Magruder sent a message to Chenault asking him and his pilots to return to the U.S. military. The question of Chenault's rank was left open. Chenault was not unwilling to return to the army, but he wanted the rank of general. He sent a message to Madame Chiang Kai-shek asking her opinion. There would be advantages to making the AVG a U.S. Army unit, he told Madame Chiang, in aircraft, supplies, reinforcements, and discipline. The only disadvantage, he said, was that a commander might replace him with less experience in China. Kaidaw Field was less than 100 miles from the Thai border and barely 300 from Chiang Mai, Thailand's second largest city. With no effective early warning system, Chenault worried that Kaidaw was too vulnerable to a Japanese airstrike he sent out P-40s to look for Japanese planes in and around Chiang Mai. The patrol found nothing, but Chenault was still jumpy. He wired Chung King, asking to move the AVG out of Burma back to China. 
Madame Chang replied that the AVG could leave Kaido and move to Kunming, but that the Hell's Angels would have to stay at Ming Aladan, near Rangoon. Kaido would be manned as a backup field and repair station between Rangoon and Kunming. The P-40s of the 1st and 2nd Squadrons, 34 planes in all, flew the 700 miles to Kunming on December 17th, arriving just hours after Japanese bombers hit the city. Most of the AVG ground crews and supplies traveled by truck over the Burma Road to China, a slow and dangerous journey even after the road had been widened and leveled in 1940. It took them two weeks to reach Kunming. What Chenault did, he had in every village in the areas that we operated on, he had people who had radios. On, they either had uh, mostly CW, die to die dit. But they had these lookouts in every village. So when we'd move into a base, like this would be the, the map, take the map and this would be this, the base we're gonna operate out of. Then you draw concentric circles going out to 300 kilometers. And so when all these villages would have to, any village that heard something, like engine noise, I hear engine noise, and put a flag right on that village. And pretty soon, you wouldn't believe it, but these, pretty soon these flags began to line up and you knew they were coming in. It was so accurate. And we knew, and when we had hit that 150 kilometer circle, well, that's when we'd launch, and that'd give us time to get to 18, 20,000, which was our best altitude. And uh, they'd be there. And the other thing that stood us in good stead with that system was if a guy got lost, which is real easy to do, uh, first, first village you'd come to, you'd get scattered, you know, in a fight or something. <clears throat> you'd come down over that village and shoot a short burst. That information would go immediately back into your base. Well, you didn't know where you were, but the base knows where that village is. When they give you a vector, then you can come in on it. It's real simple, but by God, it was effective. Three days after the P-40s arrived in Kunming, Chenault's early warning net reported Japanese bombers coming from Vietnam. First squadron took to the air, 16 P-40s, and turned southwest to intercept the bombers. Second squadron flew back up. While four of the pandas stayed close to Kunming, four others patrolled the northwest to catch any bombers attacking in a hook approach. Jack Newkirk, leading the group northwest, spotted a formation of 10 bombers below him with no fighter escort. They were Kawasaki Ki-48s of the 21st Hikatai based at Hanoi. Introduced in 1939, the Ki-48 was fast and maneuverable, but carried a light bomb load. With no armor and only three machine guns, it was vulnerable to attack. In Burma, it was often used as a dive bomber. Its allied code name was Lily. Newkirk's P-40s dove out of the sun, firing at the Lilies from far out of range. The bombers jettisoned their loads, turned tail, and ran. Newkirk led his pandas back to Kunming. A few minutes later, the Adam and Eves spotted the same group of Lily bombers south of Kunming. Sandel ordered two pilots to fly top cover. The P-40s attacked the bombers from every direction in a disorganized melee. They seem to have forgotten all of Chenault's lessons about hit and run attacks, two plane formations, and Japanese tactics. The two pilots flying top cover also ignored their instructions and joined the fight. The enemy formation was a Diamond Four flanked by two Vs of three. The right hand V was hit first by a mass of P 40s, and all three Lilies were shot down. The AVG was credited with four Lilies at the cost of one P-40. Heading home, 
Eddie Rector ran out of fuel and bellied into a field near Kunming. Japanese records for the flight show three lilies lost and seven damaged, including some that crash-landed at Hanoi. Fourteen airmen died on the mission. For the Japanese unit, it was their worst bloody nose in a long time. Shaken by the loss of 30% of the planes and a third of the airmen on a single raid, the 21st Hikatai never returned to Kunming. The people of Kunming greeted the AVG pilots as heroes. For months, the city had endured near constant bombing by the Japanese. The Americans had driven off the attackers and saved the city from another dose of devastation. You can't believe how grateful they were. Those poor people had been bombed all these years, you know, and just killed thousands. I mean, just the, the cities used them as a target. Chinese civilians saved many Allied pilots who were shot down in China in spite of cruel and severe reprisals by the Japanese. You know, the guerrillas were the Chinese communists. They never committed any large forces or anything, but they joined together with the nationalists uh, against a common enemy. Uh, and, uh, and they were the guys, uh, they were responsible for uh, saving a lot of our troops. Unless you just fell right on top of the Japanese, right, they'd get you out of there. The Chinese people are, are just such wonderful people. Really, I mean, a Chinese friend is the best friend you'll ever have. In America, a nation hungry for good news of the war and desperate for heroes, Time Magazine picked up the story and christened the AVG as the Flying Tigers. The name was probably suggested months before by one of the young men working in Washington, D.C. on the AVG's behalf. Back at Kunming, Chenault was not pleased by the Tigers' performance. He sat them down, listed off their mistakes one by one, and told them, next time, get them all. Ming Aladan, the AVG 3rd Squadron was joined by 34 British Buffaloes and four Blenheim bombers, but only half of the Buffaloes were combat ready. With no real reserve closer than Kunming, 900 miles to the northeast, Olsen's Hell's Angels began calling themselves the Lost Squadron. On December 23rd, the Imperial Japanese Army Air Force struck Rangoon. From airfields at Bangkok, Thailand, and Phnom Penh, Cambodia, 60 Ki-21 heavy bombers took off for Burma without fighter escort. The Mitsubishi Ki-21 carried more than a ton of bombs, six machine guns, and a crew of five to seven men. It was used with great success in China, Malaysia, and the Philippines. Allied codename, Sally. Fifteen Sallies were headed for the airfield at Ming Aladan. They were to be joined by Mitsubishi Ki-30 light bombers, allied codenamed Ann, escorted by Ki-27 fighters, codenamed Nate. The three groups were supposed to rendezvous over Thailand and strike Rangoon in one large formation, but their timing was off, and the attackers reached the city in three separate waves. The Sallies came first, in tight V of V's formation. A few miles behind them came the Ands, escorted by a disorganized gaggle of Nates. About a dozen P-40s rose to meet the attackers. RAF Buffaloes damaged one bomber before the Tomahawks joined the battle. In the melee that followed, two Tomahawks were shot down. Paul Green bailed out and survived. Five of the Sallies were shot down one-third of the formation with the loss of 30 crewmen. South of Rangoon, six other Hells Angels faced a tight formation of 18 Sallies heading for the oil refinery at Sirium. Leading one three-plane flight, Neil Martin's P-40 was caught in a hail of fire from the Sallies machine guns 
and went down in flames. Two of the Sallies were shot down. A third group of 27 bombers hit Rangoon, killing more than a thousand people, mostly civilians. One of those bombers crashed on the way home. It was another bloody nose for the Japanese. At the end of the day, they had lost seven bombers with many more damaged, though the Allied claims were higher. Japanese pilots and gunners claimed to have destroyed 43 Allied fighters that day. In fact, the RAF lost five buffaloes with their pilots, and the AVG lost three planes and two pilots. On Christmas Day, the Japanese struck at Rangoon, launching a mass formation of 63 bombers escorted by 25 fighters. Again, their battle plan came apart, splitting the attackers into three groups. At Ming Aladan, there were only 12 tomahawks and 14 buffaloes ready for battle against an armada of 88 enemy planes. Two AVG replacement pilots arrived from Kaida on Christmas Eve with a truckload of ammunition. As the Japanese formation crossed into Burma, Olsen sent his Hell's Angels up to meet them. The first fight occurred over Sirium, south of Rangoon. 20 Sallies, escorted by 15 Hayabusas, were heading home after bombing the city. The Nakajima Ki-43 Hayabusa was one of Japan's most successful fighters. Highly maneuverable, Ki-43 shot down more Allied aircraft than any other Japanese fighter. And most of Japan's aces flew Ki-43s, Allied codename Oscar. Seven P-40s tore into the Japanese formation, seven against 35. They shot down 12 bombers and three fighters, which they mistakenly identified as Zeros. Two P-40s crash-landed, but both pilots escaped with minor injuries. North of the city, the RAF and the rest of the AVG tangled with a much larger mass of bombers and fighters, leading a fight of three P-40s. Parker Dubois dove on a Hayabusa. Overtaking the enemy fighter, he rolled sharply to avoid ramming it. His wingtip sliced through the Oscar's wing, severing it at the root, and the Oscar spun away. Dupoy landed with four feet missing from his own wing. The Allies claimed 28 Japanese planes destroyed on Christmas Day. Japanese records put their losses at about half that number. In the chaos of aerial combat, several pilots or gunners might claim the same kill, each thinking it was his own. The excitement, the panic, the adrenaline, and the confusion of combat made such errors inevitable. On Christmas Day, the Japanese pilots and gunners who attacked Rangoon claimed a whopping 38 Allied fighters shot down. Half again, the total number of Allied fighters in the air. Actual Allied losses were two tomahawks and five buffaloes. The men at Ming Aladan were nervous and worn out. In less than two weeks, the Hell's Angels had lost a quarter of their pilots, dead, wounded, or missing. Their planes were badly shot up. Leaflets dropped by Japanese planes warned of an airborne invasion. Olsen wired Chenault, send reinforcements or move the squadron to Kunming. Chenault assigned Newkirk's second squadron to reinforce Hell's Angels at Rangoon. Then he sent an appeal to President Roosevelt for more fighters and pilots, and for three dozen twin-engine bombers with American crews to form the second American volunteer group. The president responded with a promise of more pilots and 50 of the new Curtis P-40E Kitty Hawks. The AVG had several follow-ups in the, in the concept, and the second AVG, uh, they had, uh, had a bomb group and they had three more fighter groups. And, but they didn't get any further than Australia and they stopped them there. Because the war was going on and they needed them down there and not, they never got to China.
At Rangoon, in the days after Christmas, the pilots braced for another Japanese attack. But the skies were quiet. The Japanese fighters and bombers were standing down and licking their wounds. On December 31, General Magruder sent a cable to Washington recommending that the AVG should become the 23rd fighter group. Despite the AVG's unquestioned success in its first three battles, Magruder offered a very negative assessment of the unit's potential. Unless it was completely reorganized with U.S. Army officers, enlisted men, and logistics support, the AVG could have little military value. Newkirk's Panda Bears, including Tex Hill, all arrived in Rangoon by New Year's Day. Frustrated that no Japanese planes were rising up to fight, Newkirk decided to take the fight to the enemy. The target was a small airfield about 50 miles inside Thailand, near the village of Tak. Four pandas took off from Ming Aladan before dawn on January 3rd. Newkirk led the mission with Bert Quisman on his wing. Hill flew on Howard's wing. The pandas arrived at sunup to find nine Nate fighters idling on the ground like sitting ducks. Unknown to the pandas, the Nates were just returning from their own pre-dawn mission. We were going over there and going to surprise the guys. Went out that daylight and catch them on the field. Well, unfortunately, we forgot to look up. Bert Christman had uh, engine trouble. He had to turn back. So there were three of us in string headed down to straight the field of the airplanes that were lined up. Well, first thing I know, this guy slid in between me and Howard. And I was just, I mean, I'm right behind this guy. And I was, I was so excited that I didn't even bother to look through the sight. We had a ring and bead sight on the airplane. I, uh, but the way I ammo is loaded was every fifth round was a, an incendiary. So it looked just like a hose coming out. I just was just right behind this guy, I wasn't no 50 yards. And uh, he just blew up. But simultaneously, a guy I didn't see made an overhead pass on me and he shot 33 holes in my airplane. I never saw him. Just when I pulled off this guy, just shot down, I'm pulling into another guy coming this way head on. When he shot head on, these little I-97s, they had what was equivalent to about a 30 caliber, uh, 7.7 .7 or something like that. And those bullets stuck in the prop. And when it did, well, it threw my prop out of balance. Well, I throttled back and got down, and we were scattered at that time and separated, and, and I came on back to Rangoon. And I got there, and, uh, and Jim Howard came in, uh, uh, and Newkirk. And Newkirk had shot down two airplanes. Jim had gotten these on the ground. He didn't even know this. All the guy got on his tail. I said, you go look at your airplane. I went over there, and he had 11 bullet holes, and, his airplane. Early the next morning, the Japanese struck back at Rangoon with Nate fighters and Ann bombers. The Nates shot down three pandas, though all survived. It was the Japanese first clear victory over the AVG. So began a pattern of daylight raids by the P-40s against Japanese airfields in Thailand, and pre-dawn raids by the Japanese against Rangoon's airfields. In mid-January, hard-pressed American and Filipino troops were preparing for a last stand on the Bataan Peninsula. Foreseeing victory in the Philippines, the Japanese transferred two NATE squadrons and two bomber groups, about 75 aircraft, from the Philippines to China and Burma. General Sugawara Michio commanded the Japanese air forces in the region. In Malaysia and Singapore, his bombers could operate with little or no opposition. But in Burma, his losses were staggering, and he had no taste for more. He left a small force in Thailand and transferred most of his fighters and bombers to other, less troublesome battlefronts. Although Newkirk's pandas were well outnumbered by the Japanese, 
they gave better than they got. Before long, 2nd Squadron could only put 10 P-40s against the much larger Japanese raids. On January 16th, the ground crews and staff of three British hurricane squadrons docked at Rangoon. With these reinforcements, Rangoon appeared secure. But the Japanese Imperial Army had other plans. At the end of 1941, the Japanese were pushing south through Malaysia, driving the British and Commonwealth troops ahead of them. In the Philippines, American and Filipino units were retreating under the Japanese onslaught. Beyond Malaysia, Australia lay open to Emperor's armies. From New Guinea, the Japanese could threaten not only Australia, but the main British and American supply routes to East Asia. To the west lay India, Britain's greatest colony. If India fell, Japan could reach the oil fields of the Mideast and link its Asian empire with Germany in the west. But to reach India, the Japanese had to cross Burma, a country protected by mountain ranges like fortress walls. The British believed that their navy could protect Burma from an attack from the sea and that the mountains would protect it from an attack over land. But on January 19th, far down the narrow tail of Burma that runs along the Malay Peninsula, a small Japanese detachment overran the airfield at Tavoy, 300 miles south of Rangoon. And the next day, 35,000 Japanese troops entered Burma near Tak, east of Rangoon. Abandoning their trucks for pack horses, the Japanese 55th Division had crossed the mountains on foot to invade Burma. The British Burma Division had 18,000 soldiers on paper, but its fighting corps was just 4,000 British and Indian troops against 35,000 Japanese. The Japanese had to conserve their forces, and so they, they knew they couldn't occupy every square mile of China, so they took the best real estate all down the coasts, all the ports. And this meant that the Chinese were then fighting without any external means of support, except for the one supply line that ran through Burma. The Burma Road was China's only remaining link to its allies. If the Japanese could capture Burma and cut the fragile lifeline, China would stand or fall alone. And I've always said that if he had put out his hand and said, how do you do, will you marry me? I would have said, how do you do? Yes, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. Tex was a big deal because he'd been in life and time and a lot of magazine, a lot of newspaper stories about the flying tigers. And John Wayne had made a movie and played Tex's part in that movie. And that was early in 1942. So he was, you know, the town was excited about having the Reverend Sam Hill's brother come into town. <laughs>